Another show, another Samsung Galaxy. I'm starting to lose track. In this case, the Galaxy Grand 2 with Note 3-esque faux leather back, a 5.25-inch LCD 720p screen, a 1.2 gig quad-core processor, 1.5 gig of RAM, and 8 gig of mass memory plus micro SD. The battery is large and replaceable at 2600 milliamp hours. I'm quite liking the look of this combination and value for money. HTC has popped out the Desire 700, effectively a budget HTC One, with slightly larger 5-inch screen but lower QHD resolution. You only get a Snapdragon 400 processor, 1 gig of RAM and no OIS in the camera, but you do get stereo boom sound speakers on the front. Plus you get micro SD expansion apparently, something you can't say about the original one. Staying again with value for money, another Nokia Lumia, the budget 4-inch screen 525. Actually, it's a 520 with double the RAM at 1 gigabyte, but it remains stunning value. Expect to see this under £100 on pay-as-you-go, yet able to play the biggest games. In phone show 213, I pronounced the £300-ish LG made Google Nexus 5 as astonishing value for money and my number one phone in the world. I haven't changed my mind, but I have found something that makes <clears throat> the Nexus 5 look overpriced. This is the Motorola Moto G, also running what is effectively stock Android, found on pay-as-you-go in Europe at under half the price of the Nexus 5 and a third the price of Android flagships, yet you have to look quite closely to see the differences. Why would you pay three times as much for, say, a Galaxy S4? Well, there are a few reasons, not least increased storage, faster processor, better camera and so on. But the Moto G does run into fair lick, seems to have plenty of headroom for most apps and games and is a quality piece of kit with comparatively few emissions. It's your typical 2013 black touchscreen slab, of course, with slightly rounded corners and, relatively speaking, quite a large bottom bezel here. This is the first of the cost-cutting measures, none of which are showstoppers, but it's worth mentioning as I go along. Despite the near Galaxy S4 and Nexus 5 dimensions, the 720p screen here is smaller and a mere 4.5 inches. Still, there's, there's nothing shoddy about the screen itself. It's bright and colourful and with contrast, almost up with the Nexus 5, remaining visible to some extent, even outdoors in the sun. The Moto G is all plastic, but it feels very solid in the hand, with no creaks whatsoever. The size is perfect, with power screen button top right, as is traditional these days, unless you have an iPhone or HTC device. Uh, volume rocker keys beneath, micro USB on the bottom, 3.5mm up top, and that's your lot. The solidity here belies the fact that the back of the Motorola Moto G is removable for switching from the black here to over a dozen coloured alternatives with the back off and it takes some doing. The battery is revealed. Great, this gets better and better, you think. The facility to swap or replace batteries, except that you can't. Quite inexplicably, the battery is covered with a big sticker, battery not user removable in five languages. It's tempting to get a screwdriver out and try levering the cell, but maybe that would break some fragile ribbon cable, so I didn't try it. Gah! All this plastic, clippery, only to not have battery access after all. Just a small slot here for your micro SIM card. Oh, and being able to swap on a differently coloured back. Well, whoopee doo. On the incredibly subtly textured back is an indented Motorola logo, a trivial design point that works really well because your index fingertip naturally seeks this out as a place to rest and support the phone. And it's well away from the relatively precious camera glass at the top, which is slightly recessed anyway, plus there's LED flash and a surprisingly loud mono speaker. Here's a demo. This is full volume. It's a bit scratchy. It's a bit scratchy and tinny but people will still get complaints from upstairs as our good friend Richard Chase found out. It's loud. Inside are slightly less than cutting edge specs, a 1.2 gigahertz quad core Snapdragon 400 with one gig of RAM, over 400 megabytes of which is free after booting, which is just about room for Android 4.3 here to breathe. Flash storage is more of an issue as many Moto Gs come with five gig free only out of the box, while the uh, 16 gig version is 13 gig free of which more later. It's stock Android throughout, hooray, with just a few Motorola application additions. Assist uses calendar and time rules to silence the phone with a few exceptions that you can enable, such as specific numbers for incoming calls and responding to any number calling twice in five minutes, for example, because there's an emergency. 
it's a small application, but useful to set up and forget, especially if it gives you an uninterrupted night's sleep. Motorola Migrate is the sort of thing we're seeing more and more of these days, handling the transfers of your text messages, call history, SIM contacts, photos and some settings from one device to another. In this case, from an older Android phone to this one, there's no support for coming in from another platform, sadly. Other content types, just main contact and calendar, will come in, of course, via standard Google and other account syncs. And Migrate just fills in the gaps around the Google Sync and Restore. Otherwise, everything's very familiar on the Moto G with a set of five home screens, shortcuts, folders of shortcuts, a dock, and a swipeable main application menu, all bog standard, plus the ubiquitous on-screen Android virtual controls, all good to see. Just about the only thing which isn't stock Android is camera. It's a custom Motorola UI based around swipe gestures. From the left for the main settings, HDR, flash, focus mode, slow motion video effect and panorama. From the right for the photo gallery, up and down Nokia style, interestingly, for digital zoom. The default focus mode involves autofocus all the time and a single tap anywhere on the screen takes the shot, which is probably a good thing for smartphone newbies. Though anyone who knows what they want will want to switch it so that a focusing reticule can be dragged around the scene to set specific focal points and exposures like that. Still, give me a proper hardware shutter button any day. Photo quality is mediocre, as you might perhaps have predicted, given the price point being hit here, but it'll do for most people with unadventurous or unambitious needs. See the samples here. It's cold, it's autumnal. This is test video footage at 720p. The maximum the Moto G will support. Still pretty good for the price though. Media playback is competent and looks decent enough on the bright LCD screen and fairly loudspeaker, but it's, it's rather hampered by a number of factors. One, Motorola only includes the base MP4 codecs, so anything out of the ordinary won't play. Two, the limited storage means you're best off not sideloading content in the first place. And three, assuming you opt for streaming media, note that there's no LTE support. Uh, mind you, if your budget has necessitated a Moto G in the first place, you're probably not on an unlimited data tariff anyway. One thing you may have noticed while the Moto G's back cover was off, other than the sadly sealed battery, was the 14 tiny torque screws holding the device together. This is typical Motorola over-engineering, but the visibility of these screws does mean that once they're removed, the entire device will be exposed and repairable. Hopefully, there might even be a decent chance of swapping out that pesky battery with a bit of luck. Look, whatever the caveats and disappointments just mentioned, the Moto G is the perfect first Android smartphone to recommend to family and friends. There's no carrier or manufacturer of bloatware, no duplication of functions, uh, no weird gestures or swipes or systems to learn or fiddle with. It's robust. It's simple, it does the basics perfectly, and it doesn't cost the earth to buy or replace. It's the poor man's Nexus 5. I'm proud of it. If the G has a weakness, then it's in the internal storage. I can see even new users filling 8 gig in fairly short order with games, music, and video captures. So always recommend the 16 gigabyte version if it's available in your market. This is the Motorola Moto G. Hacking is an apt word here, even though it's not entirely me doing the hacking. All the clever stuff is being done by the community over XDA developers. Here's the setup. Google announces Android 4.4 KitKat, but leaves off the two-year-old Samsung Galaxy Nexus from the rollout because it uses the wrong chipset, um, uh, OMAP rather than Snapdragon, um, which leaves Galaxy Nexus fans like me in a dilemma. Yes, the new Nexus 5 is shiny and fast, but many of us have a soft spot for the Galaxy Nexus as having the gorgeous AMOLED colours on screen and most of all, having a replaceable battery. Pull it if you hit troubles. Swap it if you run out of gas. Replace it all together after a year or two of use to have fresh performance. You can't do that with a Nexus 4 or 5. Other advantages include a proper landscape dock. I use that all the time. The possibility for an extended battery as here. I higher milliamp hours and the use of a full size SIM slot, which are possibly important for some. So my mission was to find a way to get Android 4.4 KitKat on the Galaxy Nexus. 4.3 worked just fine, of course, but hey, this is a challenge and I succeeded Android 4.4. But the process very definitely isn't for the faint hearted and it's not trivial. It's not even easy. First of all, what's available? Here's a short link to the relevant set of posts on XDA developers. 
There are half a dozen people compiling the Android open source project code donated by Google and adding in magic source of their own in an effort to get all aspects of the Galaxy Nexus working under KitKat. Picking one is hard, though I'll recommend one in a moment, but happily most of the pain I'm about to regale you with is a one-time thing, and other firmwares can be flashed on afterwards easily with little more than copying on a file and hitting install. So you can try out several firmwares before deciding which you like the best. Now, time. Set aside lots of time. I allocated an evening to the process armed with a Windows 7 laptop and another desktop alongside with which to research stuff as I went and asked for help on Twitter. <coughs> now, bear in mind, I've never reflashed an Android phone before in my life, only the rather easier to flash Symbian ones. But I'm no dunce and I can generally follow instructions. And it still took me four hours to start to finish. Yes, I'm sure expert ROM flashers will pipe up here. It would only have taken them 15 minutes, but I was being every man here. So take my word for it and allow a few hours at least to give you a flavour of what needed to be done in approximately the right order. One, install the PDANet Android drivers for Windows so that it recognises the Nexus. Two, install the Android SDK onto the PC. Three, use the fast boot tool to unlock the Galaxy Nexus's bootloader. Four, flash over the latest clockwork mod recovery boot app. Five, start the phone in fast boot mode, mess things up and get bamboozled by the mess of clockwork mod exit options. Realize that the stock firmware has regained control and so flash clockwork mod on again. This time set the option to make it stick. Seven, reboot the phone normally and copy across any chosen KitKat ROM zip file into the SD card. In the Nexus's case, just its root folder. Number eight, finally reboot into recovery mode and then pick the zip file and sit back and watch it install. Phew, and that was all for flashing a Nexus device, absolutely the easiest Android device to reprogram. I hate to think of the extra complications with flashing something harder. The end result is kind of fun though. As I record this, I'm still playing with the various ROMs, all of which have little defects and idiosyncrasies but they'll get better and hopefully in a month I'll have a fully stable KitKat firmware on the Galaxy Nexus, the device that Google forgot. And despite its age, I'll be able to go back to enjoying the, the AMOLED display, the swappable batteries and the proper desk dock. Phew, a very geeky, hooray!